at uh, McMaster University, Mike Risk and his associate Jody Smith were the ones that pioneered this technique on how to get the record out of these corals. And we're going to use, they have a minute drill, which you can get at each one of these layers, which are only about 200 microns thick. So you need a very small drill to drill individual layers and get the record out of each one of these layers. And then we heard about these strange deep water corals in Norwegian fjords. That was beginning of the 90s. And so we rented a camera, lowered it, and there they are, these deep water reefs of unexpected dimension and structuring and rich in biodiversity. And we all are aware that climate change can occur not within thousands of years, but even within tens of years. Well, following the coral conference, this piqued a lot of interest with a lot of people, including some of the government agencies. Um, of course, we noticed when we were at the coral conference, there was a lot of video of other deep sea coral reefs, but there's none off Canada. So we had a sort of an inkling of what these should look like, but all we had were pieces of coral like this that the fishermen had brought us. We had no idea what this coral would look like in, a, in its forest, in its setting on the seafloor. So, but to do that, you need a submarine or a remotely operated vehicle. These cost a lot of money to mobilize and a lot of money to get out here. And it took another year after that to actually get that money together, get the equipment together, and actually get out to look at these things. And the result is what you're going to see in a few minutes, in a few seconds, is deep sea video, the very first deep sea video taken of corals off eastern Canada. And you'll see an amazing diversity of corals. This diversity of corals that you'll be seeing in this video is occurring right in the front edge of the Scotian Slope, where you see the label of Northeast Gully, or Northeast Channel, with the two arrows. And it's right along that break at about 500 meters of water depth. And the currents here are extreme. The Bay of Fundy empties in and out of this channel, the Northeast Channel, has the highest tides in the world. And it actually prevented us from staying on the bottom very long because the ship would move the ship and the vehicle. But what you'll see is huge amounts of material in the water. And that's why these corals do so well here, is there's lots of particulate water material in the water that they can feed on. Well, we were finally successful in getting a ship that could handle a, a remotely operated vehicle, the Martha L. Black from the Quebec Division of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. We had a staff uh, from Dalhousie University, Memorial University, McGill University, but I think most importantly we had a representative from the fishing industry, the guy who actually helped us find this stuff. We also had representatives from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the uh, Geological Survey of Canada. The vehicle we're using is called ROPOS. It's a remotely operated platform of ocean science run out of the Can Canadian Submersible Facility in Vancouver. It has many different kinds of sampling devices, which you'll see in this video. It has two 40-horse motors on the back, and the umbilical cord that you saw is what powers this vehicle and allows it to stay on the bottom much longer than manned submersibles might. Well, when we first got to the seafloor at 500 meters water depth, this is what we saw. The coral in the distance is about two meters high. It's called pink coral or paragorgia. Small corals in the foreground are peminoa, which are the ones that we were interested in because these are the ones that have the climate record. You see all the fish swimming around. The white coral is probably the same species as the pink one, we're not sure. And you can see several different kinds of coral living in the same place. And you see all the fish. This answered one of the first questions is, are these corals fish habitat? And you'll see throughout this video that fish are everywhere around these corals. As we get a little bit closer to the coral, you see this fish nestling in the coral, just like a bird in a tree. And this was a pretty common sight. The shrimp you see swimming around in the front they seem to be attracted to light. Even though they never see light, they were attracted to it, and so were a lot of these fish. You might notice just the huge numbers of fish. When you went away from these coral, you just didn't see very many fish. Fish were also attracted to light. They may have seen light, they may go up to the surface, but certainly not often. There's a huge amount of sea life around these corals. There's at least two different kinds of corals that you see in the front. These are hard corals that have a hard calcium carbonate skeleton. 
this white coral you see here, sort of spongy, and there you see a fish, gives you a good idea of the scale of this large Paragorgia. Looking at another coral, we see a sea urchin and a little tunicate hanging onto it there, and all the usual shrimp and associated other organisms. Here we see some individual corals. We see two different types of things, polyps of these hydrozoans. A little bit of a close-up, you can see them out. And here you see a really close-up, and then you see that one contract. As the vehicle approaches, you can see another large piece of Paragorgia coral, again, probably two meters high almost. Polyps fully extended. This is often called bubblegum coral or strawberry coral because of its color. Uh, when it dries up, it looks much different than this. See fish everywhere swimming out of it, lots of shrimp in it, a uh, little needlefish swimming by here. Well, of course, we weren't just down here to take pictures. We also wanted to get some sampling. This is the clipper arm or sampling arm. There's two of these on this vehicle. It's able to go and clasp uh, small, large things, rocks. In this case, a piece of coral that we want, that we need to be able to do our climate records on the base of this coral. You see on this piece of coral, uh, the actual, the original living coral seems to be restricted only to the tips. There's soft coral hydrozones have taken over part of the skeleton. And this seemed to be a common phenomena is that when the uh, original coral would die, these original skeleton would be taken over by these other uh, animal forms. Still, the animal form or the skeleton still maintained, however, a uh, good living space for all the fish. What's going to happen now is we have to position the, the vehicle. Uh, there's a little bait box you'll see in the front. These, the top will open. And what we attempt to do then is stick the material into the bait box, close the top, so that when we move, the stuff stays, the specimens stay inside that, uh, the bait box. Uh, it looks like it's going to get killed here, but you can, you'll see how incredibly flexible this stuff is. Even though it's hard coral, it's still very flexible. And this was still alive when we brought it back up to the surface. One of the major problems is getting it released, trying to get it untangled from the uh, tweezers. And then, of course, the lid closes down on it. Well, besides sampling living coral, we all wa also wanted to sample dead coral because these sometimes were larger and contained much more of a climate record. You see here all these brittle stars all over the seafloor. They often were covering the seafloor when there wasn't very much coral around. Uh, this particular coral turned out to be one of our better ones because it was ab about an inch in diameter as opposed to half inch in diameter for most of the small living ones. As with the living ones, these have to go into the sample boxes because otherwise they'd just be lost from the current. One of the few limiting factors in the ropo staying on the bottom is when you fill up all these uh, boxes, you want to be able to sample once they fill up. You've got to bring it up and empty this thing out. The other capability we have with this is being able to actually suction material off the corals. The biologists were very interested in finding out the associated fauna living on these corals, not just the fish, but shrimp, uh, sea urchins, other echinoderms, all kinds of different stuff. And one of the things we did, you can see that little hose to the right of the screen, is a suction hose. And what it does is suck stuff into those, those uh, canisters, which are all numbered. The reason we're looking at those was to get the numbers right. As you see the camera panning down, you're going to see it pan down to the coral and to where the suction head is. You see the suction head is just about to be turned on. It's trying to get things like that little shrimp that tried to run out of the way. And we ended up getting quite a few, probably several different types of species, small invertebrates living on this coral. You can see everything, the one shrimp at the top, I think he 